Oops. Probably would have helped to have the mic unmuted. Anyway, hello everyone. I'm back again. See, I didn't bail. Didn't have a panic or an anxiety attack much. Didn't, uh, didn't find a reason not to stream, withdraw from the world. Yep. So I'm here. And we've got T and all of you and the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. So, not a bad way to spend the morning. that's assuming the mic is picking me up okay my throat is still a bit sore from uh, getting scoped last week and the uh, biopsies which I haven't heard back from I really expected to by now so I suppose no news yet it's good news right to tell you quick if it's bad ah, tea's still hot though Okay, story time. When we left off, Robin Hood had recruited the tinker that the sheriff tried to have serve a warrant on him. And the tinker was going to be the new, basically, bard for the Merry Men, at least up until Alan Adale comes along. Chapter 2, The Shooting Match in Nottingham Town. I think this is where uh, Ka comes in in the Disney version, right? The snake with the creepy eyes that goes flying around because his head gets stuck in a balloon. Probably no Ka in this version, though. Hey, Sparky, glad you're here. So... Chapter 2, The Shooting Match in Nottingham Town. Then the sheriff was very wroth because of this failure to take Jolly Robin, for it came to his ears, as ill news always does, that the people laughed at him and made a jest of his thinking to serve a warrant upon such a one as the bold outlaw. And a man hates nothing so much as being made a jest of. So he said, Our gracious lord and sovereign king himself shall know of this and how his laws are perverted and despised by this band of rebel outlaws. As for yon traitor Tinker, him will I hang, if I catch him, upon the very highest gallows tree in all Nottinghamshire. Then he bade all his servants and retainers to make ready to go to London town to, speak, to see and speak with the king. At this, there was a bustling at the sheriff's castle, and men ran hither and thither upon this business and upon that, while the forge fires of Nottingham glowed red far into the night like twinkling stars, for all the smiths of the town were busy making or mending armor for the sheriff's troop of escort. For two days this labor lasted. Then, on the third, all was ready for the journey. So, forth they started in the bright sunlight, from Nottingham town to Foss Way, and thence to Watling Street. And so they journeyed for two days, until they saw at last the spires and towers of great London town. And many folks stopped as they journeyed along and gazed at the show they made riding along the highways with their flashing armor and gay plumes and trappings. In London, King Henry and his fair Queen Eleanor held their court, gay with ladies in silks and satins and velvets and cloth of gold, and also brave knights and gallant courtiers, Thither came the sheriff, and was shown into the king's presence. A boon, a boon, quoth he, as he knelt upon the ground. Now, what's what thou have, said the king? Let us hear what may be thy desires. O oh, my, O oh good my lord and sovereign, spake the sheriff, in Sherwood Forest, in our own good shire of Nottingham, liveth a bold outlaw, whose name is Robin Hood. In good sooth, said the king, his doings have reached even our own royal ears. He is a saucy, rebellious varlet, yet I am fain to own a right merry soul withal. 
But hearken, O my most gracious sovereign, said the sheriff. I sent a warrant to him with thine own royal seal attached by a right lusty knave. But he beat the messenger and stole the warrant. And he killeth thy deer and robbeth thine own liege subjects, even upon the great highways. Why, how now, quoth the king wrathfully, what wouldst thou have me do? Comest thou not to me with a great array of men-at-arms and retainers? And yet art thou not able to take a single band of lusty knaves without armor on breast in thine own country? What wouldst thou have me do? Art thou not my sheriff? Art not, are not my laws in force in Nottinghamshire? Canst thou not take thine own course against those that break the laws or do an injury to thee or thine? Go, get thee gone and think well. Devise some plan of thine own. But trouble me no further. But look well to it, Master Sheriff, for I will have my laws obeyed by all men within my kingdom. And if thou art not able to enforce them, thou art no sheriff for me. So look well to thyself, I say, or ill may befall thee as well as the thieving knaves in Nottinghamshire. When the flood cometh, it sweepeth away grain as well as chaff. Then the sheriff turned away with a sore and troubled heart. And sadly he rued his fine show of retainers, for he saw that the king was angry because he had so many men about him and yet could not enforce the laws. So as they all rode slowly back to Nottingham, the sheriff was thoughtful and full of care. Not a word did he speak to anyone, and no one of his men spoke to him. But all the time he was busy devising some plan to take Robin Hood. Aha! cried he suddenly smiting his hand upon his thigh. I have it now. Ride on, my merry men all, and let us back to Nottingham Town as speedily as we may. And mark well my words, before a fortnight is past, that evil knave, Robin Hood, will be safely clapped in the Nottingham goal. But what was the sheriff's plan? As a Jew takes each one of a bag of silver angels, feeling each coin to find whether it be clipped or not. So the sheriff, not that there's not some anti-Semitism right here, all rode slowly and sadly back toward Nottingham, took up thought after thought in turn, feeling around the edges of each, but finding in every one some flaw. At last, he thought of the daring soul of Jolly Robin, and how, as he, the sheriff, knew, he often came even within the walls of Nottingham. Now, thought the sheriff, could I but persuade Robin Nye to Nottingham Town, so that I could find him? I warrant I would lay hands upon him so stoutly that he would never get away again. Then of a sudden it came to him like a flash, that were he to proclaim a great shooting match and offer some grand prize, Robin Hood might be over-persuaded by his spirit to come to the butts. And it was this thought which caused him to cry, Aha! and smite his palm upon his thigh. So, as soon as he had returned safely to Nottingham, he sent messengers north and south and east and west to proclaim through every town, hamlet and countryside, this grand shooting match. And every one was bidden that could draw a longbow, and the prize was to be an arrow of pure beaten gold. When Robin Hood first heard the news of this, he was in Lincoln Town, and hastening back to Sherwood Forest, he soon called all his merry men about him and spoke to them thus. Now, hearken, my merry men all, to the news that I have brought from Lincoln Town today. Our friend, the Sheriff of Nottingham, hath proclaimed a shooting match and hath sent messengers to tell of it through all the countryside, and the prize is to be a bright golden arrow. Now, I fain would have one of us win it, both because of the fairness of the prize and because our sweet friend the sheriff hath offered it. So we will take our bows and shafts and go there to shoot, for I know right well that merriment will be a-going. What say ye, lads? Then young David of Doncaster spoke up and said, Now listen, I pray thee, good master, unto what I say. I have come straight from our friend Edom of the Blue Boar, and there I heard the full news of the same match. But master, I know from him and he got it from the sheriff's man, Ralph of the Scar, that this same knavish sheriff hath but laid a trap for thee in this shooting match, and wishes nothing so much as to see thee there. So go not, good master, 
for I know right well he doth seek to beguile thee, but stay within the greenwood, lest we all meet dole and woe. Now, quoth Robin, thou art a wise lad, and keep as thine ears open and thy mouth shut, as becometh a wise and crafty woodsman. But shall we let it be said that the sheriff of Nottingham did cow bold Robin Hood and seven scores fair archers as are in all merry England? Nay, good David, what thou telleth me maketh me to desire the prize even more than else I should do. But what saith our good gossip Swanthold? Is it not a hasty man burneth his mouth, and the fool that keepeth, keepeth his eyes shut falleth into the pit? Thus he says truly, Therefore we must meet guile with guile. Now, some of you clothe yourselves as curdle friars, and some as rustic peasants, and some as tinkers, or as beggars, but see that each man taketh a good bow or broadsword, in case need should arise. <clears throat> As for myself, I will shoot for the same golden arrow, and should I win it, we will hang it to the branches of our good greenwood tree for the joy of all the band. How you like the plan, my merry men all? Then, good, good, cried all the band right heartily. A fair sight was Nottingham Town on the day of the shooting match. All along upon the green meadow beneath the town wall stretched a row of benches, one above the other, which were for knight and lady, squire and dame, and rich burghers and their wives, for none but those of rank and quality were to sit there. At the end of the range, near the target, was a raised seat, bedecked with ribbons and scarves and garlands of flowers, with the sheriff of Nottingham and his dame. The range was two score paces broad. At one end stood the target, at the other a tent of striped canvas, from the pole of which fluttered many colored flags and streamers. In this booth were casks of ale, free to be broached by any of the archers who might wish to quench their thirst. Across the range from where the seats for the better folk were raised was a railing to keep the poorer people from crowding in front of the target. Already, while it was early, the benches were beginning to fill with people of quality, who kept constantly arriving in little carts, or upon palfreys that curveted, curvetted gaily to the merry tinkle of silver bells at bridle reins. With these also came the poorer folk, who sat or lay upon the green grass near the railing that kept them off the range. In the great tent the archers were gathering by twos and threes, some talking loudly of the fair shots each man had made in his day, some looking well to their bows, drawing a string betwixt the fingers to see that there was no fray upon it, or inspecting arrows, shutting one eye and peering down a shaft to see that it was not warped, but straight and true, for neither bow nor shaft should fail at such a time, and for such a prize. And never were such a company of yeomen as were gathered at Nottingham Town that day, where the very best archers of merry England had come to this shooting match. There was Gill of the Red Cap, the sheriff's own head archer, and Duck on Crookshank of London, Lincoln Town, and Adam of the Dell, a man of Tamworth, of threescore years and more, yet hale and lusty still, who in his time had shot in the famous match at Woodstock, and had there beaten that renowned archer, Clem of the Clough. And many more famous men of the longbow were there, whose names had been handed down to us in goodly ballads of the olden time. But now all the benches were filled with guests, lord and lady, Burger and dame, when at last the sheriff himself came with his lady, he riding with stately mien upon his milk-white horse, and she upon her brown filly. Upon his head he wore a purple velvet cap, and purple velvet was his robe, all trimmed about with rich ermine. His jerkin and hose were of sea-green silk, and his shoes of black velvet, the pointed toes fastened to his garters with golden chains. A golden chain hung about his neck, and at his collar was a great carbuncle set in red gold. His lady was dressed in blue velvet, all trimmed with swans down. So they made a gallant sight as they rode along side by side, and all the people shouted from where they crowded across the space from the gentlefolk. So the sheriff and his lady came to their place, where men-at-arms with hauberk and spear stood about, waiting for them. Then, 
when the sheriff and his dame had sat down, he bade his herald wind upon a silver horn, who thereupon sounded three blasts that came echoing cheerily back from the gray walls of Nottingham. Then the archers stepped forth to their places, while all the folk shouted with a mighty voice, each man calling upon his favorite yeoman. Red cap, cried some. Crookshank, cried others. Hey, for William or Leslie, shouted others yet again, while ladies waved silken scarfs to urge each yeoman to do his best. Then the herald stood forth and loudly proclaimed the rules of the game as follows. Shoot each man from yon mark, which is seven score yards and ten from the target. One arrow shooteth each man first, and from all the archers shall the ten that shooteth the fairest shafts be chosen for to shoot again. Two arrows shooteth each man of these ten. Then shall the three that shoot the fairest shafts be chosen for to shoot again. Three arrows shooteth each man of those three. And to him that shooteth the fairest shafts shall the prize be given. Then the sheriff leaned forward, looking keenly among the press of archers, to find where the Robin Hood was amongst them. But no one was there clad in Lincoln green, such as was worn by Robin and his band. Nevertheless, said the sheriff to himself, he may still be there, and I miss him among a crowd of other men. But let me see when but ten men shoot, for I wot he will be among the ten, or I know him not. And now the archer shot, each man in turn, and the good folk never saw such archery as was done that day. Six arrows were within the clout, four within the black, and only two smote the outer ring so that when the last arrow sped and struck the target, all the people shouted aloud, for it was noble shooting. And now, but ten men were left of all those that had shot before. And of these ten, six were famous throughout the land, and most of the folk gathered there knew them. These six men were Gilbert of the Red Cap, Adam of the Dell, Deccan Cruikshank, William of Leslie, Hubert O'Cloud, and Swithin of Hertford. Two others were yeomen of merry Yorkshire. Another was a tall stranger in blue, who said he came from London town. And the last was a tattered stranger in scarlet, who wore a patch over one eye. Now, quoth the sheriff, to a man-at-arms who stood near him, seest thou Robin Hood amongst these ten? Nay, that I do not, your worship, answered the man. Six of them I know right well. Of those, Yorkshire yeomen, one is too tall and the other too short for that bold knave. Robin's beard is as yellow as gold, while yon tattered beggar in scarlet hath a beard of brown, besides being blind of one eye. As for the stranger in blue, Robin's shoulders, I ween, are three inches broader than his. Then, quoth the sheriff, smiting his thigh angrily, yon knave is a coward as well as a rogue and dares not show his face among good men and true. Then, after they had rested a short time, those ten stout men stepped forth to shoot again. Each man shot two arrows, and as they shot, not a word was spoken, but all the crowd watched with scarce a breath of sound. But when the last had shot his arrow, another great shout arose, while many cast their caps aloft for joy, of such marvelous shooting. Now, by our gracious lady fair, quoth old Sir Amias of the Dell, who bowed with fourscore year and more, sat near the sheriff. Ne'er saw I such archery in all my life before. Yet have I seen the best hands at the longbow for threescore years and more. And now, but three men were left of all those that had shot before. One was Gil of the Red Cap, one that tattered stranger in scarlet, and one Adam of the Dell of Tamworth Town. Then all the people called aloud, some crying, Ho for Gilbert of the Red Cap, and some, Hey for stout Adam of the Tamworth. But not a single man in the crowd called upon the stranger in scarlet. Now, shoot thou well, Gilbert, cried the sheriff, and if thine be the best shaft, five score broad silver pennies will I give to thee beside the prize. Truly will I do my best, quoth Gilbert, right sturdily. A man cannot do aught but his best, but that I will strive to do this day. So saying, he drew forth a fair, smooth arrow with a broad feather, 
and fitted it deftly to the string. Then drawing his bow with care, he sped the shaft. Straight flew the arrow and lit fairly in the clout, a finger breadth from the center. A Gilbert! A Gilbert! shouted all the crowd. And now by my faith, cried the sheriff, smiting his hands together. That is a shrewd shot. Then the tattered stranger stepped forth, and all the people laughed as they saw a yellow patch that showed beneath his arm when he raised his elbow to shoot, and also to see him aim with but one eye. He drew the good yew bow quickly, and quickly loosed a shaft, so short was the time that no man could draw a breath betwixt the drawing and the shooting. Yet his arrow lodged nearer the center than the other by twice the length of a, bar of a barley corn. Now, by all the saints in paradise, cried the sheriff, that is a lovely shaft in very truth. Then Adam of the Dell shot carefully and cautiously, and his arrow lodged close beside the strangers. Then, after a short space, they all three shot again, and once more each arrow lodged within the clout. But this time, Adam of the Dells was farthest from the center, and again <clears throat> the tattered stranger's shot was the best. Then, after another time of rest, they all shot for the third time. This time, Gilbert took great heed to his aim, keenly measuring the distance and shooting with shrewdest care. Straight flew the arrow, and all shouted till the very flags that waved in the breeze shook with the sound, and the rooks and daws flew clamoring about the roofs of the old gray tower, for the shaft had lodged close beside the spot that marked the very center. "'Well done, Gilbert!' cried the sheriff, right joyously. "'Fain am I to believe the prize is thine, and right fairly won. "'Now, thou ragged knave, let me see thee shoot a better shaft than that.' "'Not spake the sheriff, uh, the stranger, but took his place, "'while all was hushed, and no one spoke, or even seemed to breathe, "'so great was the silence for wonder of what he would do. Meanwhile, also, st quite still stood the stranger, holding his bow in his hand. One could count five. <coughs> then he drew his trusty yew, holding it drawn but a moment, and loosed the string. Straight flew the arrow, and so true that it smote a gray goose feather from off Gilbert's shaft, which fell fluttering through the sunlit air as the stranger's arrow lodged close beside his of the red cap and in the very center. No one spoke a word for a while, and no one shouted, but each man looked into his neighbor's face amazedly. Nay, quoth Adam of the Dell presently, drawing a long breath and shaking his head as he spoke. Two score years and more have I shot shaft, and maybe not all times bad, but I shoot no more this day, for no man can match with yon stranger, whosoever he may be. Then he thrust his shaft into his quiver, rattling, and unstrung his bow without another word. Then the sheriff came down from his dais and drew near in all his silks and velvets to where the tattered stranger stood leaning upon his stout bow, whilst the good folk crowded upon, around to see the man who shot so wondrously well. Here, good fellow, quoth the sheriff, take thou thy prize, and well and fairly thou, hast thou won it, I trow. What may be thy name, and whence comest thou? Men do call me Jocko Teviudale, and thence am I come, said the stranger. Then by Our Lady, Jock, thou art the fairest archer that e'er mine eyes beheld, and if thou wilt join my service, I will clothe thee with a better coat than that which thou hast upon thy back. Thou shalt eat and drink of the best, and at every Christmas tide, fourscore marks shall be thy wage. I trow thou drawest better bow than that same coward knave, Robin Hood, that dared not show his face here this day. Say, good fellow, wilt thou join my service? Nay, that I will not, quoth the stranger roughly. I will be mine own, and no man in all merry England shall be my master. Then get thee gone, and a moraine seize thee, quoth, cried the sheriff, and his voice trembled with anger. And by my faith and troth, I have a good part of mind to have thee beaten for thine insolence. Then he turned upon his heel and strode away. 
It was a right motley company that gathered about the noble greenwood tree and Sherwood's death that same day. A score and more of barefoot friars were there, and some that looked like tinkers, and some that seemed to be sturdy beggars and rustic hinds. And seated upon a mossy couch was one all clad in tattered scarlet, with a patch over one eye, and in his hand he held the golden arrow that was the prize of the great shooting match. Then, amidst the noise of talking and laughter, he took the patch from off his eye and stripped away the scarlet rags from off his body and showed himself all clad in fair Lincoln green. And quoth he, Easy come these things away, but walnut stain cometh not so speedily from yellow hair. Then all laughed louder than before, for it was Robin himself that had won the prize from the sheriff's very hands. Then all sat down to the woodland feast and talked amongst themselves of the merry jest that had been played upon the sheriff and of the adventures that had befallen each man of the band in his disguise. But when the feast was done, Robin Hood took Little John apart and said, Truly, am I vexed in my blood, for I heard the sheriff say today, Thou shootest better than that coward knave Robin Hood that dared not show his face here this day. I would fain let him know who it was who won the golden arrow from out his hand, and also that I am no coward such as he takes me to be. Then Little John said, Good master, take thou me and Will Stutely, and we will send yon fat sheriff news of all this by a messenger such as he doth not expect. That day, the sheriff sat at meat in the great hall of his house at Nottingham Town. Long tables stood down the hall, at which sat men-at-arms and household servants and good stout villains, and all fourscore and more. There, they talked of the day's shooting as they ate their meat and quaffed their ale. The sheriff sat at the head of the table upon a raised seat upon under a canopy, and beside him sat his dame. By my trot, said he, I did reckon full roundly that that knave, Robin Hood, would be at the game today. I did not think he was such a coward. But who could that saucy knave be who answered me to my beard so bravely? I wonder that I did not have him beaten. But there was something about him that spoke of other things than rags and tatters. Then, even as he finished speaking, something fell rattling among the dishes on the table, while those that sat near started up, wondering what it might be. After a while, one of the men-at-arms gathered courage enough to pick it up and bring it to the sheriff. Then every one saw that it was a blunted gray goose shaft with a fine scroll about the thickness of a goose quill tied near to its head. The sheriff opened the scroll and glanced at it, while the veins upon his forehead swelled and his cheeks grew ruddy with rage as he read. For this was what he saw. Now, heaven bless thy grace this day, say all in sweet Sherwood, for thou didst give the prize away to merry Robin Hood. Whence came this? cried the sheriff in a mighty voice. Even through the window, your worship, quoth the man who had handed the shaft to him. We will pick up with chapter three tomorrow. <coughs> Uh, I tell you, my throat does not want to heal from uh, that procedure. Anyway. Oh. Eh, nobody oh, I forgot to change the thing. Oops. All right. Anyway. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, and we'll pick up with Chapter 3. I hope everyone has an excellent morning, evening, afternoon, middle of the night, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. Thank you again for joining me.